My name is George. Oh, that's it. Just George. Yeah. Everybody call. Even my grandkids call me George. <laughs> I I live in Madison, Georgia, and I've been sharpening for a few years now. And I find that when I have a bumper or shear, and I put a new bumper in, and I still have room, so that the points cross over. I have to be careful of that. I get a piece of leather, or I have a piece of leather, about one sixteenth of an inch thick, and I take my hole punch, leather hole punch, I dial it to the smallest hole, and then I make the hole, and then I dial it to the largest hole punch, and I make on, I punch that out, uh, trying to get that small hole right in the center. If, you, if you're not in the center, it's just as long as it, it's in there somewhere, and you're not going to break it. And then I slip that over the of the um, the end of the of the silencer before I put it in the into the shear hole and I slip that on and I've used two one two sometimes even three of these just to make up the difference and uh, it works very neatly so there you are Hello, my name is Tracy Marks. I live in Ardmore, Oklahoma, and I've created a simple little homemade jig to help me to assemble clipper blades. The way it works is this. You lay down your, your uh, clipper parts just as you normally would on this the flapper here, and when you assemble them, um, you oil them, assemble them, and you close the flapper here, there's a piece of foam that holds everything together for you. So you clamp it into place, and when you flip it over, you don't have to worry about anything moving. And after you get it flipped over, the threads are lined up perfectly so you can drop your screws in and get them started. And it does three things for me. Number one, it saves a little bit of time on getting those screws started because it's easy to fumble the flip process. Number two, it saves a little bit of strength in the fingers and dexterity required just if you're doing a lot of them because there's less uh, strength required to hold everything together. And number three, it also saves just a little bit of time on getting the setback of the cutter blade just right because with this device oftentimes uh, it's just right or it just takes a small tweak to get it to the correct setback so it saves a little bit of time there it's not a huge savings but it does save a little bit of time and it's a little bit easier let me show you a little close-up on how it works so you can uh, see for yourself if you think it's a good idea all right here's how i use the assembly jig i first i lay down the post that i have and i set the um, assembly jig over the post. Next step is to place the comb on the post. Uh, it drops into place. Lay down my cutter and the spring socket. At this point I would do the oiling. Um, I'm not going to do it in this case. Once I've done the, the oiling, set the cutter in place. And then I drop the spring socket over the post as well. And it usually uh, will drop uh, into place. The next thing I do is I look really closely at the cutter and I slightly move it up or back to the precise setback I want. There's no guarantee that it'll stay there, but um, often it stays really close. It saves me some time there. I close the flapper and gently squeeze. Uh, there's a little bit of flexibility to the wood and I attach the clamp. At this point, the uh, post, sometimes it falls out, sometimes you take it out, but now you can see that the screws are um, exactly aligned, the threads. So I just drop in the screw, give it a couple of uh, finger tightening, drop in the second one. At this point, my left hand is just generally gently holding. It's not requiring any dexterity. Now I give it the screws a little bit more finger tightening than, than I would if I didn't have this jig because I'm going to trust that the setback is pretty close. I take it apart and then I look at the setback. At this point I would do my normal adjustments um, uh, to, to get the setback exactly right and then I tighten it down. To make this I use some 3 16 cents uh, plywood. These two pieces are about uh, eight inches by two and a half inches. There's a couple pieces of foam um, here, kind of a high density foam. Need a hinge, clamp, and um, this 
uh, comb was a broken comb and I put a couple bolts through it and uh, cut them off about a half inch is how far it sticks up. Rounded off the edges a little bit to, to uh, make the post uh, easier to uh, drop through the, the holes and um, getting them the right length is uh, probably the thing that takes some precision. They can't be too long or too short. My name is Steve Paylett. Sometimes when you see me on the chat forums, you'll see me listed as John Paylett. That's my first name. Nobody that actually knows me calls me John, except Dennis Burks. <laughs> my quick idea is something I learned at one of the sharpening jams. Actually, it was the National Beauty Tool Sharpening Guild many many years ago. It was a retired sharpener who taught me this and I said oh well that's easy so when I have nothing better to do I stop in at the nail places. The last one that I did I did probably pretty close to three hundred dollars worth of cuticle nippers. Takes only a few moments. So what I use is a used up Velcro pad. This is so dirt simple it's amazing to me that nobody does it on a normal basis. I actually take the cuticle nipper and bite down on the paper gently. Make about 15 passes. And then I flip it over and do the other side. This, I should have shown, this nipper barely cut before I started. So we have a rubber glove. I'm just going to take it, close that down, and it cut. Simple dimple, I charge two dollars. <laughs> Occasionally we have where it's been dropped, so I'll take a run it off on my flat hone and just enough to buff off that edge, the rough edge. That's it. Jim Turner here. Uh, this is my second idea. Show you what it is. This little case that you see here. It's uh, a bubble gum case or chewing gum case. Did it at Walmart. I think there's big reds on this one coming from. But I put my business cards down in here. Now, it's just like business cards. I got a pretty good stack of cards will fit in there. And it's waterproof. You can carry it wherever you want to. Just wet it. It's not going to get inside and get, damage your cards. But I think I can probably put 30, 40 cards in there. I had never counted. But that's something you get free that works great for your business cards. Hi guys, it's me, Sandy. Um, I'm here to learn, but I do have ideas. And I hope you like this one. Um, I'm not in my shop right now. And um, I don't really have much to show. But my idea is slow down. You might be thinking, slow down? What kind of an idea is that? The slower we work, the less money we make. Not necessarily. Why do you want to slow it down? Pay attention to detail. If you're too quick, you miss little things that might make your work easier in the long run. So... What do I mean by that? Well, you ask yourself, what's going to get you more work in the long run? Return customers. Happy customers. Like long-term happy customers. 
they're willing to give you good reviews. They're willing to refer. For example, I sharpen knives. You can sharpen knives fast. You can make good money. I could go sit on the corner, you know, somewhere, and uh, people realize I'm there and start bringing me their knives, and I can pump them out. I can, I can, you know, do a quick shortcut thing and use maybe three grits. Maybe start with a 120 if it's, you know, pretty good knife. Just needs to be sharpened. No gouges, no problems. 120, 240, maybe a 400. Boom. That's a good knife. It's going to slice through, through as long as you have your apex, as long as you've taken care of things the way you need to do, you can slice through paper. Mm, but how long is that knife going to last? Initially, that customer is going to be happy. But how long is it going to last? Are they going to stay happy? Are they going to think two, three months down the road? Hmm. Uh, this isn't too sharp after all. I feel like it's still, it already needs to be sharpened again. Now, take it back. Slow down. Pay a little more attention to detail. Why not be willing to make a little less money initially, less knives per hour, take it up to a 600 grit, maybe even an 800, 1,000. Ooh, 1,200. No comparison to a 320 or 400 grit. Takes a little longer. Yeah, but now think about that customer. That customer isn't just going to be happy initially. They're going to stay happy. Three months later, wow. Four months later, wow. Man. Now this person, they care about my knife. Which customer is going to be more willing to return, refer you, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, sorry, don't know how to count. That many more customers come back and maybe even give you an amazing review that hundreds of people are gonna see. Ask yourself, do you wanna make a lot of money real quick up front, but not have any return customers? Very few referrals? Or dial it back, slow down, pay attention to detail. Worry more about quality over quantity. And in the long run, your reputation, that's what brings in the business. That's my idea. I hope you like it. I'm um, Carrie Serta. I live in a suburb of Cincinnati. My shop is in Mainville and I um, have bought a magnet that cuts, the, it, it helps me sharpen the cutter, not the cutter, the comb side of the blade better. It picture. looks like a cowbell. Um, it's got two little rails on it and those rails are exactly the width of the uh, rails on the blade. So when I place the magnet on the blade, I line it up with the rails and I don't have to worry as much about um, getting even pressure on the blade. All I have to do is worry about the pressure of pushing down on the wheel. And it has worked really well for me. Um, I, I tend to not have to go back to the wheel as many times as I did um, when I started learning with the smaller magnet. My name is John T. Smith, and I've been a saw fowler and scissor sharpening for 65 years. Well, I'm 81. <laughs> to remove the screws that are, I don't know the proper name for that type of screw, but it's the kind that's level with the scissor and it has the two little holes on the side 
that you had to use a special tool to get them out with. I used a Dremel tool and I used one of these sanding discs to shape it like the uh, tools used to remove the, uh, the screws that are sort of embedded with the two holes on the side. And uh, I kept sanding it down until it fit in that particular size. And I think you're probably going to run across maybe two different sizes in there. And I'm thinking about making me another one because some of them are just as tools a little bit too big for it. So I'm going to make another one. But take your scissors and uh, mark on there and then grind it down until it fits in the slot. And that's a hardened screwdriver, so it won't bend with you, taking the screws out. And that's just a copy of that tool, but it's made with a hardened steel, so that's probably got a Rockwell hardness of probably 60. So chances are you won't bend that. I have bent those little tools before. Well, if I don't, if it helps somebody else out, that's what I would like to say. Like you say, we had to work together. Hello, my name is Tracy Marks. I live in Ardmore, Oklahoma, and I have an idea for creating a digital receipt. I do all for paper receipts, but rather than keeping a paper copy for myself, I just create a quick uh, digital receipt. I uh, have a, I use the spreadsheet app called Numbers on the iPhone. Android has a different spreadsheet uh, program, but you can see I created a spreadsheet uh, that has uh, all the information I need at the top, and then in the bottom part, is uh, some cells with uh, quantities and calculations for me. So for example, the top part, if I wanted to change the date, you tap on the date that says the 23rd, let's change it to 24th. You just hit enter. And that's probably gonna stay all the same, obviously for the rest of the day. Here you would type in the name of the person or salon, and then the city and the state you're in. And of course that line will stay the same all day. So the only thing you have to change each time is the name of the person. And when it comes down to the um, area of the receipt, uh, you type in the quantity. So let's say two, for example, and let's say it was $28 each. It calculates the total as 56 there. You can see the grand total, but let's say the sales tax of at 8.25%, um, and it automatically calculates that and does the total for you again. So then I could, uh, let's say it wasn't two uh, salon shares, but let's say they were grooming shears or beveled something and you uh you can see that the total changes the grant the tax calculation changes the grand total if you wanted to add anything else here um, you get it all like you want it whenever you're finished uh you hit done and now you see the finished receipt and to save a screenshot of that there's a shortcut on the iphone called burping your iphone where you tap three times on the back and it saves a screenshot like this and then I uh, touch that so that I can do a quick cropping to get rid of some of the extra information at the top and bottom that I don't really need. And when I'm done with that, um, I save it to my photos. So now that the digital receipt is saved to my camera roll and I can uh, download it to my computer for my records or I can text or email that to a customer if they wanted a digital receipt instead of a paper receipt. Primarily it's for me so that I don't have to keep a lot of papers and uh, it's a little bit quicker, easier way for me to uh, keep track of it. So that's my idea. Hello, I'm Kyle Maynard. I'm from Hillsboro, Ohio. So here we go. It, basically all it is for those of you that have machines without rheostats on top like the Cymex, or a machine that does have one and you still want to slow the machine down more, I added an external 
uh, rheostat switch to the outside. The reason being, at one time I had a twice as sharp, and as you guys know, they don't have a rheostat. Um, it's very simple. Uh, it's just a matter of mounting the little box to, <coughs> to the outside, wherever you want it. On the inside, what I had mounted up here, which I took off, um, I have a little 12-foot uh, spool of extension cord that goes in and out. You take it out the hole over here, and it goes down, and you can plug it in and mount your uh, surge protector on the side of your box. And then you just plug both machines, both parts in, and you've got full control over your machine, your speed. So that's basically it. Any questions on how to wire it or setting it up, let me know, and I'll be more than happy to talk you through it. So it's a very simple process. It's just mounted on a screw, so you can take it off, just like so. And then I've got the cord coming out of the side, so you can plug it in. This is for the surge protector over here, and I've just got a little surge protector I think I bought at Dollar Tree I think uh, it's like got three plugs on it just plug one plug in there and then uh, if you want to plug something else in you've got your extension cord coming out you can plug in and you've got power to everything so all in one little kit I used to have my twice as sharp mounted on top here so but not anymore went to the Simex <laughs>
And all you have to do is wrap it. You don't even have to wrap it real tight. You just have to wrap it around it and it'll slowly off gas and create um, sort of a patina, but not really a visible patina. Just a, you know, a, a one molecule thick, non-reactive inert layer on the surface of the metal that prevents iron oxide from forming. So it'll, it'll form a different oxide that protects the metal from rust, from damaging rust. Um, and it doesn't affect you know, the metal in really any other way. It doesn't, it doesn't cause excessive wear. It's not gonna have an off smell or an odor or anything like that. It's just, it's a really great tool to have in your toolbox. I use it to ship, you know, high-end Japanese knives all over the world and have never had an issue with it. So that's my idea for the sharpens jam. I'm Harry McGowan from Jacksonville, Florida. Been sharpening for almost 18 years now. In the last three years, I haven't done much sharpening because I had some serious uh, health issues. But fortunately, I had trained my grandson to sharpen. So while I was away, I was I was away from home for about six months, and then when I came home, I could I couldn't work. But my grandson filled in for me, and he took he. he took over my business and kept it, kept it going. So my suggestion is, first of all, is I told Bonnie that my suggestion was, don't get sick and go to the hospital. But she says, no, that's not any good. She said, train train someone to take your place. And uh, that's what I've done. And I won't be sharp, but, and I, I'll sharp as long as I can, but when I leave, my grandson's gonna take it over. And that's my suggestion. Hello folks out there in Sheerland. My name is Keith Hewitt. I'm from Evansville, Indiana. And I got a wonderful idea of how to get an appointment with a salon that will not let you in there. Okay, here it goes. First of all, after they refuse to let you in there, you wait till you need a haircut. And you kindly go in or call them up and you make an appointment to get your hair cut. And then after you get into the salon seat, you open up your little case and you say, which one of these shears would you like to cut uh, my hair with? I sell Panika shears. These are the finest shears on the market. Pick one out. That's all there is to it, folks. Guaranteed way to get into any salon you can't get into. Have a good day. Hi, I'm Pat Boudreau. I'm from the Central Maine area. And today I'm gonna to have an idea about clipper blade sharpening. Some people like to sharpen the hardware, which I call everything else other than the blades, which includes the spring, the socket, the screws, and the guide. What I do to wash them is I put them in a tub of a gallon of warm water with two ounces of simple green, put a bristle brush to them for a few seconds and they come out nice and clean and then to dry them. That is the idea. Some people hold them in their hand and blow compressed air on the hardware and I don't think that blowing compressed air directly onto your skin is a good idea. Compressed air is pretty powerful under certain circumstances. It can penetrate the skin and if things are just right it can also penetrate a blood vessel, introduce an air pocket, and then that will be a blood clot that can travel. So it's not really too terribly safe. I don't like to do it. Reflected air is okay because that has a lot less energy. So what I did is um, I clean my I clean my hardware. I put them on a bath towel in, in in piles, approximately five inches apart, in the same order that they were in the muffin tin. And then to to dry them, what I do is I went to Walmart and I went to the kitchen section, and for ninety eight cents. I bought this stainless steel kitchen sink strainer. I bought the one without the handle because the mesh size is larger and it makes for easier airflow. So what I do is I have these piles and I put the kitchen sink strainer over the pile. I then take my compressed air, put one hand on top of it 
and blow compressed air in. It only takes three to five seconds. And then you go on to the next pile. It works really well. The, the, the parts will rattle around a bit, but as long as you have that on there and holding it down, um, it works really well. You're going to feel air, but it'll be reflected air. Um, one thing I like to do also is to place my hand in such a way that the outside of my hand is down on the towel and shielding the next pile from the airflow so that the, the guides don't go flying off your bench. And uh, it's I believe it actually dries them more thoroughly this way. And it's a fairly efficient way to do it if you're doing it all in one step at a time. So that's my idea. Thank you very much for watching. My name is uh, David Riggs. I live in Marion, Indiana, central Indiana. Uh, I started a sharpening service. Oh, it's been a couple of years ago. I started out with uh, just sharpening knives, saw chains, circle saws, and things like that. Then I uh, go to my barber one day, and I thought, who sharpens your shears? And he's like, you would not believe how hard it is to find somebody to come sharpen. She said, Normally, once a year, they come through around the town, and uh, it'd be really nice if somebody local would learn to do that. So it's like, well, let me look into that. It sounds interesting. So uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, I was trying to find a way basically to uh, uh, present the customer back with a, a sharp knife and uh, without, you know, the possibility of being injured. So I got online and looked around and uh, I found these craft paper sleeves and they're for uh, kitchen utensils basically. But you can get uh, like 2,000 of them for like $25. They're two and three quarters wide by 10 inches long. Um, so I was using those, you know, slide the knives back in, give to the customer and uh, that kind of hit me after I started sharpening some shears. I wonder if that'd be a good idea there. So uh, I'd been to a couple different uh, salons where I'd gotten, you know, two or three pair from each stylist. And it was kind of like, well, maybe this would work to kind of keep them separate from each other. So I asked the stylist, hey, you think this would work? You know, maybe slide your shears in this sleeve, put your name on it. I'll keep them separate from everybody else. That way I can go out and sharpen. I have a, uh, a sharpening unit, a truck, basically, that I sharpen out of. So uh, that's what I do. Uh, they write their name on it. They give me the, their shears in this sleeve. These sleeves full of shears. But it keeps them separate. And, and I can uh, work on them individually. You know, just kind of focus on those two or three pair that I've got. Uh, once, once I do uh, finish them up, just for safety, I'll fold it over, staple it, and basically it has a thank you label on it, which I stamp on there, and also just uh, caution extremely sharp in red. So it's just a little sleeve that I have, and uh, it seems to work pretty good, so it may uh, be a benefit to someone else. Uh, that's just my idea for, for the sharpening jam. I'm Ron DeWitt, and I'm out of Wake Forest, North Carolina. And my idea are the grippers. Now, for us older folks, we know that these are used to open jars. For you younger folks, you may have no idea what these are. I use them. I take two of them. This is my Loctite or the thread lock. It's clear fingernail polish. Works really nice on the shears, but it gets stuck and I have trouble opening them. So one on the bottom, one on the top. And I have the strength now to open this. The other thing that I use this for are some of these handy dandy thumb tighteners. 
okay, that are so thin that my fingers won't do it, I can use this to grip that and it gives me the strength in my old hands to loosen or tighten it. And those last few turns. Okay, that's it. I'm Steve Paylette and my idea is how to adjust the blades without killing yourself and putting sharp points into your, the ends of your fingers. Okay, if we look at this blade, this cutter is even with the back rail. If you look at this side, it's up quite a bit. So to make this easy to fix, I'm using a small screwdriver. This was a 332nd. And I insert it between the back of the socket and the back of the spring here. All I'm doing is twisting on this ever so much and now it's fixed. Okay, a lot of people have big trouble with the wall competition blades and the ones that have the ribs on it. You sharpen them up exactly the same way. The problem that most people don't understand because they put them back together and they don't cut. And you resharpen it and you put it back together and it doesn't cut. The simple solution is Put the back of the cutter even with the back rail. The rails on the combs on the wall are quite thick. You need to push it all the way to the back and then it will cut. Assuming you've got correct tension and your socket is set correctly. Apparently a lot of people have this tool but they don't know fully how to use it. The tang goes in here and if you can pull it and wobble it a great deal your socket is bent from people yanking it off the clipper so the easy way to fix that is insert it take a pair of pliers or vice grips and tighten here and here Just gently tighten it it will put this back to being parallel with your comb and now you got a real good chance that your comb and your cutter is going to do a nice job. Uh, this is Jim Turner with Scissor Magic and Blade Runner companies. Scissor Magic is for the barber and beauty salons Blade Runner is for the uh, dog groomers and veterinarians. Uh, got a couple of uh, things, and also our address, we're in Star Tech, South Carolina. But uh, got a couple of things here to share. You did a shear that uh, you can't find a screw for, or that the uh, screw, if it's got threads in it, is wore out. This is what I use. It don't work on all shears. I've got so, so many different sizes, it fits several, but this little thing right here, this side here, comes off the needle on my diabetic shot that I take for my insulin shot. And this little piece here will slide right in here, like this. Makes a good snug fit, like that. You can cut it off to snug with this. Then you just take and screw it, it'll make its own threads. Just sort of force it, screw it into this plastic piece here after it's cut off. It will expand into this plastic a little bit and make it hold. It's not 100%, but I've got one or two out there that's lasted over a year and still going. So uh, most of them last six, eight months, And but I get them free. They come with my needles from my uh, diabetic stuff. And also, uh, there's more of these you can get uh, different sizes. This is off the diabetic, but you can also get these in different sizes. 
at uh, hardware stores, auto parts, whatever, different sizes that go into walls, whatever, to screw, uh, put picture frames up, whatever. Just, uh, it just pushes into the wall and you screw a screw in and put a picture frame, whatever, up with. Same thing, just a different size. But you can get several different sizes up. But that saved me a few times on some old shears, but it just fits, like I say, just right in the hole here. And it just pushes right in. Looks like it fits, it looks like it's made for it. And, and then one goes bad, you can just replace it with another. So that's my main idea. 